Hello, um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 529th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rana Pondick and Jessica Holmes on the event of Rana's show at Mark Strauss through April 16th. And we're thrilled to welcome poet Jennifer Bonilla Edgington here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with social, uh, thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at The Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Since 1984, American sculptor Rana Pondick has used the language of the body in her work. She has had 51 solo exhibitions and her sculptures have been included in over 220 group exhibitions, including numerous biennials. Her work can be found in the collections of 49 museums internationally. Jessica Holmes, our host today, um, her writing features regularly in Bomb, Hyperallergic, The Observer, and The Brooklyn Rail, where she also edits the Art Tonic column. Jessica is also editor-in-chief of Degree Critical and has contributed to numerous exhibition catalogs. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Jessica. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And thank you, Rona, for being here with me today to talk. And hello to everyone who has joined us, and thank you as well. Um, so, Rona, I thought um, as we began speaking, we could sort of take a look um, at uh, some images from your current show, which is up at Mark Strauss Gallery um, and, and is a new body of work for you. It is um, sort of, uh, in some ways, diverging from what you've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, and maybe you want to just start telling us um, just a little bit about the, these works and um, how they've come into being over the past few years. Um, first of all, thank everyone for inviting me and taking part in this Zoom. Um, these pieces came into being because of the virus. Um, both the works on paper and these intimately scaled pieces came partially out of need. Um, I, at the beginning of the virus, was afraid to go out and we, my husband and I, who's also an artist, Robert Feintuck, um, came to my studio, we took all my drawing materials home and we um, set me up for a number of months where I was just working. Um, Carolyn, you can advance through these images, even if we come back to them later. Um, I'm talking about a process at the beginning where I was just working on um, works on paper. If you can go to image seven or eight. Um, so, and you can go to the next one, the detail as well. So I work on Udafin, which is a very thin, almost tissue paper-like material and I draw and paint on both sides of them. When I use drawing, it's usually when I'm lost imagistically or materially and I wanna make a change in my work. However, I was in a very fertile time with my work. And so I was working and approaching the drawing 
in a different way than I normally did. And what was interesting for me uh, was to see what happened in the drawings very specifically. If you can go now back to um, the, the beginning of the smaller pieces, something that I generally want to talk about that is related to all the other work that I've done is that I want my viewer to experience my work viscerally and physically in their own bodies. What's happened with these new pieces is that the color since 2013 is in the work in a very different way. And I've heard people say to me that they feel like they can taste the color, mm. which is a new embodiment for me in terms of how someone's physically experiencing these pieces. They're seeing the color, but it's crossing their senses and they're tasting the color. That's synesthesia. So that's a new thing happening that I'm very excited by. Another thing that I wanna discuss quickly is people always say to me, so why are you using the head? What's with the heads? And I have thought about this a lot. And to me, it seems very natural. Right now, how many people take selfies all the time? Why? You think about um, the death mask, which goes all the way back to the Middle Kingdom in Egyptian work. Mm -hmm. And it goes through almost every period of art. There's a real fascination with putting ourselves either in sculpture, painting, drawing. And so for me, it just seems very natural for this to be incorporated into my work. What's interesting and might be surprising for all of you is it's more difficult for me to really talk about the work that's up right now and installed at Mark Strauss Gallery because the work is so new. Almost all of it was done in the last two years. And I, as a maker, feel like I think with my hands and I work my way through pieces very, very organically and plastically. And it's so new to me that it's actually, it, it's actually hard for me to talk about the pieces. I find 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years so much easier for me to discuss than the pieces right now. What's always been general themes for me have been gesture and posture and how gesture and posture makes meaning. Mm -hmm. If you look at all these pieces, what may not be clear is that every single head in these pieces all derive from one life cast that was made and I wanna jump ahead and just show it to you. Go to image 51. So this is the first animal human hybrid piece that I made. And this is the piece where I started using my own body castings in my work. What I did, um, and we can just quickly discuss this piece for a few minutes so you can see it. Can we just go to the next image and the next one? So this is me showing you the dog made in different stages. And the first dog, if you look at the yellow wax was so soft I had to put it on an armature because the piece just kept sagging down because the wax was so soft. This is on the right, me making the piece a second time. If you look to the right of the dog, that's the first cast from the life cast that I've used 
if you look to the left of that dog, you can see there's another head, the neck is removed, there are no ears, and the hair is removed. That head, but with the ears, I scanned, and then let's go back now to image number two. These are the same heads. The little gray head and the red head are both from that life cast that was then scanned. And with computer technology, it was reduced down to a lot of different sizes. And then I made molds of them again, and then used them in many pieces. And you can just keep advancing forward now. Um, so you can see that for me, the way in which the heads and the gestures, and what I mean by the gestures is, if you look at, for example, my hand in this position, it looks pathetic. If I do this, it's no longer pathetic. It's aggressive. It's gonna, I'm gonna punch. If I take my thumb and put it in my fist, it reads differently again. If I do this with my hand, it's another meaning that it communicates. I'm thinking about the head positions, the scale of them, and then how the hands, bodies position themselves and what kind of meaning it makes. Um, can we keep advancing? Yeah, and I think it's um, worth mentioning here, I was at the gallery the other day looking at these pieces, and I'm really interested in what you're saying about gesture. Um, I've noticed for the first time looking, um, you know, I've seen these works a few times now, but I noticed some new things just looking at them the other day. Um, for example, in the work um, Black, Blues, White, the, there is two bodies pressed up against each other. It looks like one is three-headed and the other has a single head. But when you move around the sculpture- Can we, can we advance to 28 and go through those so that, yeah. there you go. Here we go. Um, it, as you move around the sculpture, it, it becomes obvious that actually one body doesn't have a head at all. Is that correct? And the head, yes. the yes. fourth head is actually attached. So to me, um, it's, it's so fascinating to see the duplicity of gestures um, being drawn out in your work. Yeah, it's interesting. And what started happening on these small pieces is sometimes a body is borrowing a head from another body. Um, but it looks like the head is on the body. And I was very interested in how, how do you relate to that? Mm -hmm. What happens when you notice something like that? As well as the scale of the white head is so much larger than the bodies and the heads. And you start getting these weird scale relationships where the head feels more like a figure, then the figure feels like a figure. Right. And I'm interested in what happens when meanings get exchanged or, or altered, or you look at something and you're like, well, that, that seems a little odd, or why is that happening? Right. And I think maybe the scale in this case even has something to do with that too, doesn't it, Rona? I mean, these works are so much smaller than most of what you've been making for a long you know, time. A long time, over a yeah. decade. Yeah, you know, uh, th it's interesting just that you bring that up because when I finally came back to work in the studio during COVID, I was by myself. I didn't want to be around anyone. I was very paranoid and I thought, what am I going to do because um, I can't lift more than five pounds. I'm restricted because 
I have permanent spinal cord injury and I have so many levels where I have metal in my cervical spine holding me together. Um, and the fear of God was put in me by my neurosurgeon saying, do not lift more than five pounds or your head won't move any further if we have to do surgery. Now, is there a connection to my head obsession? I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, interesting fact that I'm hearing myself say right now and hard not to make some connection. Um, but I really felt like it was something I needed to do to get back to work in the sculpture because I was so chomping at the bit to work three-dimensionally where I feel most at home. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the scale needed to be on a scale that I could totally control on my own. Now, the piece that we have up right now is actually not made during COVID. This was 2014 to 2018. So let's advance to number nine. And you can just keep going forward now. Um, so these are the pieces where I was working on my own. And within a few months, I realized I could have my assistant come back that we could wear masks and work together. But I so loved what was happening in the scale in these pieces that I didn't wanna stop working like this even though my assistant came back. So mm -hmm. we just kept going. And what I was discovering was that I could make a world, maybe if, if you think about Giacometti and the kind of spaces that he made and when he made those scale shifts between like a head that felt monumental with a tiny body and he made those groupings that it removed it from your own bodily scale in a very different way. And that was something I was consciously thinking about. What happens on this intimate scale? Do you feel a part of it? Do you mm -hmm. feel outside of it? Do you look at it very differently? Um, and so, this became something very, very much a part of how I was making and thinking about these pieces. Mm -hmm. And this piece, um, I remember when Robert walked into my studio and I was close to finishing it. And he said to me, you do see that this looks like the virus, don't you? <laughs> and honestly, I had not. Um, but I got very interested and excited when he pointed that out to me. Mm -hmm. um, something that started happening is not just with the heads, but with the small bodies that I started wondering when, when you see something in an opaque color, versus a slightly pigmented translucent color. What happens? Um, go to number 23 for a minute. If you look at the heads on this body, those almost clear light yellow heads, you're looking through them. You're looking in them. On the red heads, you can see the head clearly because it's opaque. So you're looking at it. What happens when you look in a head versus at a head? Mm -hmm. Do you experience it differently? Do you think differently about it? I'm interested in, in those kinds of translations and how those meanings change either by scale, color, opacity, translucency, or even textures. Mm -hmm. I notice if I cast a head um, and there's, let's go to image number um, 19. So I'm gonna really jump ahead a little bit. 
This is called grapefruit platter. Look how those heads are a little hard to read because of the color that I'm casting them in. But they also look like grapefruits. And that was something I was very consciously thinking about. Mm -hmm. How does the color make you relate to these heads on a platter very differently than if it was just an opaque white? Right. So let's go back again to um, number 13. And let's just keep going through so that people can see and experience what's going on in this exhibition. Um, something that's hard to see in the slides is that each of these pieces, they're really so small that they're almost like the size of a book and you can pick them up. And so the relationship is very, very different. But I'm also trying to get a lot to happen in a small piece. And for the scale of the small piece to feel grand. Mm -hmm. The piece we're looking at right now is the very first piece. And if you can see it, there almost looks like there's a shiny part and a matte part. And that shiny part is where I discovered a material that I usually use to glue could be used to make these spills of color. And these spills of color for me became such an interesting discovery of how not only I could attach the bodies and the hands and the heads, but make another color do something very physical and visceral. Yes. I was actually just going to say, you know, the material in these particular sculptures is so visceral. It's a, it's a, it's a texture and it, it's got something that you just want to touch, even if you're not supposed to be touching. And I've heard you describe yourself as a material holic before. Yeah, I'm a material holic. <laughs> I'm the person that the signs in every museum that says, don't touch. Mm -hmm is there for, because I can't keep my hands off of things. Uh, I walk into a room and I wanna to touch everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, and I've often been told by security guards to please stop touching things. <laughs> and uh, just so here's that grapefruit platter and the piece that you're referring to, black, blues, white in the background. And as I think, um, I just wanted to point out um, in the grapefruit platter, there is a multitude of these heads, which is a um, motif that has come and gone from your work over the years. Um, and as we're advancing through the slides a little bit later, I think uh, just to point out to the audience, it's, it's something that you'll see in earlier work, um, these multitudes of, of similar body parts or shapes? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because I've had some people say to me, oh, these aren't hybrids anymore. And I'm like, yeah, they, they are actually, but I think because the bodies got so small and a lot of the heads got bigger mm -hmm. and the scale or focus on the hybrid and how they came together in relationship to each other is different. Um, and the interesting thing for me on these, particularly in a piece like this, I feel like this material in this piece with this color range that's going on almost feels like it came out of the earth mm. and it's an amber stone. Right. And it's not, um, it's acrylic and an aliphatic pigmented resin. Mm. And I find that interesting. I find it really, really interesting to see that it looks ice-like. Um, there are moments where, if you look at the slide on the left, the way the light is coming through the eyes, it looks somewhat demonic. Mm -hmm. You look at the one on the right and it alters. Not only do the 
relationships of the bodies and the heads change in relationship to each other every single time you walk around it so that they borrow arms, hands, heads from each other, lean into each other. The color also changes what you see and how you experience it. Right. And then, you know, I look at this and, you know, I just go gumdrops. <laughs> they are something you want to almost pluck and eat. Um, although I have to say, not everyone might share that reaction. I think you've mentioned to me that people come at you with all kinds of reactions to your work that really run the gamut. Is that true? Uh, very, very true. Um, I have... Um, witness some people walk over to something, start laughing, say they love it, they want to caress it and cuddle it. And then five minutes later, someone say, oh my God, <laughs> this is too difficult. This is intense. This is, this is weird. Um, so I, I, and I like that because I really believe that as much as we artists want to control the viewer, we can't. Mm -hmm. um, every single viewer brings their own personal, emotional, and social histories to what we look at. It's, it's impossible to control. And, mm -hmm. and I can tell you, I'm a control freak, a huge control freak. And I do want to control the world. But I realized early on, you can't. Mm -hmm. And when I realized this at a young age, I just decided, well, I'm going to make my work so much a springboard that there are going to be so many reactions to the work mm -hmm. that I oftentimes am reading about what someone's writing or saying about the work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see it, but I can definitely see what they're saying. Right. Um, it's definitely in the work. Um, and so it's not a surprise to me to hear um, the range of responses, but I am hearing pretty consistently that people who are seeing this new body of work feel the intimacy of it yeah. and say that they feel that it's almost like looking at something that's very private which I think is interesting. I don't know how other people experience the virus. I'm very used to working alone and being alone. I probably, if I have to admit, it's the place I feel most comfortable is in my studio alone. But during COVID, it felt different mm -hmm. because you had such paranoia about getting sick and I'm not in my 20s anymore, sadly. Um, and so at my age, I was even that much more concerned about getting the virus right. and needing to be alone. Right. Um, so that really affected how I was working and what I was making. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very present in this um, show and in this body of work. So this is a, an installation view where it's showing one of these small pieces and something that you may be very surprised to all hear is look at the color of that block. And um, if we put up number 12 for a minute and then we're gonna come back to the image, that green is the color of every single one of these blocks. Now go back to that, yes. That's the same green. What is altering the color of it is the orange that's on top of the green block that's making it look like a different color. Um, and if you look on the wall, there are the drawings that I was talking about earlier. Can you advance? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the drawings. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, or I don't know if I 
who mentioned this. Um, the Udafin, which has the torn edges, is uh, me gluing sometimes five to 10 to 15 layers of drawings on top of each other. And go to the detail of it, because it might show it more. So I'm using graphite, I'm using pigment, but I'm also using the actual layers of the drawing so that you see ghosts. Can you go to the next one? So go to the next detail. You can see the images popping through from other layers. And these early drawings that I worked on first during the virus, the way things were disappearing, sort of being there, not being there. You go to the next one. Became so interesting to me. And I really, really wanted to see what happened if more of these transparencies and ghost-like feelings came into the sculptures and the transparent bodies and heads became so much more of an interest to me. Everyone keeps saying to me, what's with the long noses? And this is something that happens often in my drawings where you see something and maybe five or 10 years later, it makes its way into my sculptures. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how or when this will happen, but I keep thinking what would happen if my nose starts growing mm -hmm. or part of my head starts pulling out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just playing around with this in the drawings and probably it will move into the sculptures at some point. Right. How I'm making this is a little like a shinkole for those that are interested in print, printmaking, where I take the glued parts of the udathin, and then if you go to the next drawing, oh, go back, sorry. Go back one more. So, I take the drawing and then I glue it down to another mulberry paper and I put it between felt and glass. And over months, the paper slowly dries out mm -hmm. and you've got what is essentially a drawing that looks like it's not layered, but is layered. Right. So go to the uh, next image and the next one, and then go to number 41. So you can see in the bodies how much those feelings of transparency and translucency has come into the sculptures and how that clear, almost pigmented yellow head that almost disappears Mm -hmm. pushes into the redhead and what kind of tension it makes and what kind of tension it makes between the two bodies. Um, and if you go to the next one, you can also see how those spills that I was talking about earlier um, start making almost like a painterly space three-dimensionally. Mm -hmm. Um, that I'm just very, very intrigued by. Um, and now starting to take this and move it into the bigger pieces that I'm now currently working on. And you can see how these two bodies affect each other in terms of what their postures do to each other. I can't help but wonder do people think that the two are caressing? Um, is one aggressively pushing the other? What, what, what's going on here is something that I'm interested in trying to understand myself. Right. 
And I think this um, question of bodies, you know, bumping up against each other in an ambiguous way, um, I mean, to take a walk back through your work really manifests here in Monkeys, which is probably one of your most important sculptures, right, Rona? It is, and it's um, where, so um, there were a group of five or six sculptures <clears throat> that ranged from 1998 to 2001. And these were when I started the first hybrid pieces. And Monkeys was a piece where one, I started using computer technology. And the reason I wanted to use the computer technology, if you just go to the next image. So this head is directly in proportion to a monkey head. Hmm. So the length between the top of the forehead to my chin is maybe four and a half to five inches. My life-size head is much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted it to look like it's physically removed from my body. If you go back to the next, to the first image and go one back, yeah. Um, the way I started this was I first had arms where I had wires and the arms were all wired to each other. And I was trying to get it to feel like it was literally moving so that somebody might say, stop, mm -hmm. start. And there's this implied movement, the way there is implied movement in Baroque sculpture, right. the way there is in Bernini, um, someone who I just adore. And I wanted, so the animal bodies are, modeled. There's no male, female, there's no gender reference in my animals. But I, and they're somewhat cartoon like, I think, and I wanted the arms and the heads to physically feel like a different reality. Mm -hmm. And that these two realities come together in a very different way. So if you go to, um, 46, you can see the different hand postures. And this is an example of what I'm talking about where different positions really communicate different feelings. Um, I think that fist you relate to very differently than the hand that's pressing down on the ground. And can you go to the next image? And I think it's important just to mention too that these arms and hands like the heads all come from your own body. Correct. And also all of the heads and hands, if you go to the next image, those heads, those hands are exactly from the same castings. Go back again. So those hands come from the same castings that the little ones do, as well as the heads. Through the computer technology, I was able to take a white casting, have it scanned three-dimensionally and then printed three-dimensionally on almost any scale. Um, go, go to the next image. And now go to the next one. So that head is less than a half inch in size, hmm. um, but the body is much bigger. And I like what happens. I think this is very humorous. Mm -hmm. And for me, that scale relationship becomes humorous because of the scale changes. Can you go to the next one? And here you are with Wallaby where my arm looks like it weighs probably a thousand pounds. Yes. Um, dragging this body that should be hopping around because it's a Wallaby, but it's holding it down. 
Um, I'm making very literal, stupid analogies here, but I don't want to say too much about pieces because I feel like if I say this is A for me or B, mm -hmm. the viewer stops being engaged and it becomes a fact because the artist says it's this. Right. And I really prefer to have my audience and anyone willing to look and get engaged with these pieces mm -hmm. to have a more intimate and personal relationship of their own with right. the pieces. Mm -hmm. So if we go to dog, um, I'm gonna now talk a little bit about the making of this piece. So when, I made the, the leap from my teeth pieces to making the hybrid pieces. The first thing I connected with when I took my head and hands and combined them with a dog body was, oh my God, the hybrid image has been in art since the Neolithic time from cave paintings, early sculptures, and the animal human tree human hybrids just are such rich, rich symbolic metaphoric images that have been in existence since the beginning of time. And if you go through history, it's in almost every period that work has been made. And I found that fascinating. And I thought, well, I wanna see if I can make the hybrid image be a contemporary image that's mine. Hmm. Now, when I made the first dog, it kept needing to be made and remade, first because the material was sagging, and then because if you go to the next slide, the one on the left is the first metal dog that I made, and it's aluminum bronze. And I wasn't quite happy with how it felt. So I made a mold off of it and in wax, I started altering it again. I removed the skin texture that was on the bodice of the dog and left the texture on the arms. But when I cast the first dog and the texture was still in the arms, I hated it. So we cut the arms out again, and then I changed the texture of it again and recast it and merged it back into the dog body. And this is yellow stainless steel. Right. Um, the other on the left is aluminum bronze. And the yellow stainless steel piece was when I felt really happy with it. Um, but it was a very interesting learning curve, not just in terms of the hybrid image, but also about how color affected what I was seeing in the sculpture. And if we can go to the next one. So <clears throat> this is Head and Tree. Um, and it's one of my tree human hybrid pieces. And they're, they started much earlier than 2006, but I'm showing this piece because this is the one and only piece I've ever made in my lifetime where it existed in my head first. Hmm. And the reason this happened was when I had the 19 hours of neurosurgery in 2006, I wound up in intensive care for weeks and I was on a lot of heavy drugs and I was hallucinating. And I had this recurring image of my head leaving my body, floating up into the canopies of trees and then floating up into the clouds. I can't tell you why, but it was the most restful, wonderful feeling that I had and it was this just recurring thing that I just kept seeing and experiencing when I got out of the hospital and it was a tough two years of my life because I had to learn how to walk 
and use my hands all over again. Can you go to the next image? And if you look at the way the tree is installed at Sonesbeak, um, it was in a pond. And look at the bottom of this. They also look like umbilical cords. Mm. Go back. Again, my husband, who, who maybe is my person who connects me with how my work sometimes is seen. When I finished this piece, before it went to the foundry, he said to me, you do know that looks like a spine. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh man, no, I didn't see it. But I thought, well, it makes sense given how it was made and what happened. And so it's interesting to me. This is the one and only piece where I made it in my head and had to, it had to come to life. Mm -hmm. um, can we go to the next slide? And the next one. So here you can see my head living in the canopy of the tree. And I know a lot of people think, oh, she just takes a tree and she casts it in metal. It's not what I do. I'm too insane to do that. That would be the easier thing to do. What I do is actually have bins and bins of tree parts and I use it just for the texture. And I bring the parts of the trees together like an erector set. Mm. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of doweled joints bringing these together so that it's drawn out in space but also so that technically it casts because mm -hmm. metal has to flow and it has to be a particular shape. So I'm having so many requirements to make, which is to have the tree stand, cast, and then have the kind of presence I want psychologically. Right. And so they're total fictions. Go to the next image. Now I'm trying to go back and forth a little bit. So this is from the first body of work where I made the change from working in metal to um, resin and acrylic. And you can see this is an encased life-size head. And go back to the other image. So this is the same exact head Color change, material change, look how differently you or I relate yeah. to this than I do to the one before where it's in the tree. You asked earlier if I'm a material holic. Yes, I am. I don't think there's a material I have not used. Mm -hmm. I love materials. I'm a firm believer that. Certain sculptures, certain images have to be in certain materials. Sometimes I'm working on something and I'm like, great idea for a piece, but this is not the right material for it. Right. Can we go to the next? And this is Crimson Queen Maple. I call this um, the do or die casting method. This is from no molds were used. This is what's called a direct burnout. Mm -hmm. And the way, the reason I say do or die is if something doesn't cast, you have nothing to go back to, to make it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I do these direct burnouts, there may be big passages that are missing. Mm -hmm. And what do I do? Well, sometimes I take welding rods and I turn them into branches to try to replace the sections that didn't cast. Right. Or sometimes I go back and make in wax a section and merge it back in. At the bottom of these branches are these teeny, teeny heads looking like buds growing out of the tree. 
And if you go to the next image, you can see this is going back to one of the pieces that's in my show right now. Ways in which you can see there are themes weaving in and out of my work. Right. And then let's go to the next. So this is ginkgo and this is my hand life size. And I think that gesture is very receiving. It's not aggressive. And go to the next one. I'm just trying to show you how the different themes have gone in and out of the work. So this is an early tree piece going back to 99. And luckily, um, a private collector recently approached me and he's donated um, the piece to Williams and it's gonna be installed on their campus perm permanently. Um, what is interesting for me on some of these outdoor tree pieces is what happens with the seasonal changes. In the winter, I feel like, if go back to that other image, stay here for a few minutes. Um, so on the, on the left, seeing it in the winter, you see this and you, it, the tree almost disappears. Right. However, in the summer, because it's barren, it looks like it's out of place. Mm -hmm. And I love the way it engages with nature. If you go to the next image, scattered underneath this, like apples, are these forms that I used to refer to and still do refer to as heads, even though they just have a set of teeth in them. Um, and if you go to the next image, this is Little Bathers. And this is uh, a very interesting piece where a friend of mine wanted to go see a Renoir bathers show. And I hate Renoir's bathers. <laughs> the pink puts my teeth on edge. And I wanted to see if I could make a piece that embodied what I experienced when I saw Renoir's bathers. And here's little bathers. If you go to the next image, this is it installed at the Kunstmuseum in Wolfsburg. And if you go yet again to the next image, this is dirt head mm -hmm. where it's 10 tons of earth. Go to the next and then go to the next again. So this is the detail of all those heads on the 10 tons of earth. I think you look at the head in this piece and then go back to, uh, 67. And then you look at the bubblegum pink of Little Bathers. This piece is experienced so differently, right. materially, coloristically, what you feel. To me, this does not feel like a death image. Whereas go back to Dirt Head, which is 70. This, this piece, and go to the next detail. So this piece has traveled a lot. It started at the Johannesburg, Johannesburg Biennale, and it was talked about in terms of black magic. Then it traveled to the Honingen Museum in the Netherlands, and people were talking about floods and deaths in terms of drowning, then it travels to the Museum of Modern Art in Salzburg. And in Austria, they're talking about the Holocaust. Then it travels to the Lyon Biennale. And it's at the beginning of the genetics section. And go back one more image. And then here, during the exhibition in Wolfsburg, it's installed during the virus. And it's an exhibition that talks about the mouth. 
And then how we relate to these pieces during the virus when everyone's walking around with masks became very interesting again. The piece didn't change, but the context changed. And I thought that was so incredibly interesting. So if we go to the next image and then the next, you can see how different again these teeth pieces are. And then go to the next. And now we're back at grapefruit platter. Right. Come nearly full circle. Yeah. So then go to the last image. So I think you can sort of see how so many of these weave in and out and make relationships. Um, I wish I could go back to, you know, when I first started using the body in my work, which was in the mid eighties, but that's another talk we can have at another time because I think we're gonna probably run out of time pretty soon. Right. Um, But yeah, I think that, um, you know, what you've showed us today is really just such a full breadth of um, seeing just exactly how your body is so embedded in all of these pieces. Um, I think it makes them both very personal, but also something that is um, kind of universally relatable too, because, um, because you know the body is the thing that we are stuck with all of us at the end of the day yeah and the only thing we leave behind are our teeth right <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> um, you know i'm i'm interested in the fact that um for example we do leave our teeth behind mm -hmm. and you know it's a very big thing when we grow our first set of teeth and lose our first set of teeth right. and then get our adult teeth. Right. And then as we age, desperately try to hold on to our teeth mm -hmm. uh, and what relationships we have to our bodies. Right. Yeah. Um, for me, it's also interesting that I am now perpetually in my work at a specific age. I'm not aging. Hmm. That's true. That's true. What is it to go back and see the works that are 20 years old and put them up against now? It, it's, inter it's interesting. You know, I, when I, at the beginning of the virus, um, when Dirthead was requested by the Kunstmuseum of Wolfsburg, um, you know, I had to, check the piece by myself right and I had 400 of these all over my studio floor mm -hmm. and I kept looking at them in relationship to what I was doing now so what happened teeth are creeping back into my work interesting teeth seem to be um symbolic across cultures too and um they are like a um a symbol in anxiety dreams there's just so much that's potent about them yeah i don't know what nightmares you have i have <laughs> nightmares about being naked you know in front of people um speaking publicly and having no teeth having and no realizing teeth. five minutes later i'm toothless or having them falling down the steps and having them fall out is a common dream. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can, you, you can say them all. You right. know. <laughs> well, Rona, thank you. This has been really illuminating and, um, and I've loved seeing you draw the connections between your older bodies of work and what is on view at Mark Strauss now. And, um, Carolyn, I wonder if there are any questions that people would like to ask of Rona. Yeah, thank you so much, Rona and Jessica. Um, it's fascinating. 
Um, our first question is from our friend GE, if you wanna turn your mic on and go ahead and ask. Oh, oh there we go, hi. Um, looking at all the work, um, I keep thinking of, um, especially the shapes, the colors and everything, I keep thinking of uh, the way the poet Ovid raises the significance of uh, his theme of metamorphosis in the opening lines of the poem where he says, I intend to speak of forms changed into new entities. Do you in any way see your work as a uh, work of transformation in any way allied to this kind of thing? Um, people are gonna think that I set you up to ask that question. <laughs> So yes, oh. it's a brilliant question. I actually did a show, I can't remember dates. So at the Worcester Art Museum, I was invited to do a show and it was called The Metamorphosis of an Object. So brilliant question. Yes, um, part of the reason I picked stainless steel at one point was it doesn't feel like a fossil. It feels like it's in flux, like it's mercury, like it's moving. And that's something I'm very, very interested in. How do things morph? How do things change in meaning in front of you? In one sculpture, how do you do that? So I'm obsessed with that. So. It's wonderful because so many of the specific pieces even almost relate back to various of the creatures and beings that Ovid wrote about. So Absolutely. I love that too. It was no, no, all no. there for me. No, thank you. Well, thank you because um, for me as an artist, I live for moments like this where I'm not telling someone what to think, what to feel, and they just on their own hit it immediately. And that's fabulous because I'm a believer that art, the visual art is a language and a language should speak on its own. It doesn't need, for me, when I did the show Metamorphosis of an Object, at first everyone got so nervous because I said, no didactics. I don't want wall labels. I don't want wall text. I think we should give the viewer the benefit of the doubt and let them on their own look and experience these because they're capable. Thank you for activating us in that direction. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, GE. Um, now we'll turn the mic to our very own Ty to ask a question. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and thank you, Jessica and Rona, for this conversation today. It's been really lovely. Um, I was wondering if uh, you have any influence or connection to uh, Donna Haraway's work. Um, Haraway, Haraway, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm saying that name right. Um, don't know the work, so it's hard for me to answer. Oh, totally, sorry. It's a uh, Cyborg Manifesto, if you've heard of it. No. Just like concepts around, um, like human animal form connection. And then also like the idea of, well, and then Legacy Russell has a take on Cyborg Manifesto in like uh, this book called Glitch Feminism, which is talking about like the idea of a glitching or um, a morphing body. So I guess maybe the question is like your ideas around glitching and morphing bodies and human animal form. Well, you know, as I said, this has been in existence in every period of art, of making. Um, and I think it's had different meanings in different time periods. When it was first used, the animal and the human, I think it was used to make the human grand and powerful and animal-like or godlike. So it's different when it was used in the Neolithic time, it was different when it was used in the Egyptian. I mean, each time it was used, it's gonna have different connotations because of what's going on around us. Now it's gonna have very different meanings because we're in a different time. We don't think 
of power gods, or maybe some people do, I don't. Um, I think morphing is something that's very much part of our time. I remember when I first started doing the animal human hybrid piece and I was reading the New York Times and there was a science experiment on the cover of the New York Times of a mouse with a human ear. And I thought, oh my God, that looks like my work. And I thought how exciting and how wonderful and interesting, you know, we are living in a time where many surgeries we're using animal organs in humans. What does a human feel when they have an animal organ? Interesting question. So what does it mean now? I don't know. I, I, I you know, sometimes I think it takes years after something is made to even be understood, not just even by me as the maker, but the world around us. How do we take information in? I know I've looked at art made 20, 30, 40 years ago. I look at it now, I don't see it the same way. Yeah, I absolutely. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the, the like ear growing on the mouth. I, that blew my mind the first time I saw it. I was like, I was quite young and it just like really um, was very formative. But I also, with what you're saying, can't recommend enough um, Donna Haraway and, and Legacy Russell. I think those connections might be really fun, but. Uh. Yeah, send me, send me their names if you can, because I'd love to look them up. I'm always interested when um, someone says, oh, do you know so-and-so is making work with similar ideas? This happens, why? We may not know each other, we don't know, anything about what each other has made, but for the same reason I'm making something because there's something in the air that made me wanna do this, that person has the similar drive, whether we know each other or know each other's work or not. Absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send those names along. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ty um, and Rona, for your answer. Um, I actually have a question. Um, I And to bring up another author in here, um, it's interesting, we are all going to authors. Um, Jose Lima is a, a Cuban poet, and um, he said, ecstasy is prolonged pain. Um, and we're noticing ecstasy and also maybe the sublime and, and real pain um, in your work. and. So I don't know if you'd want to just talk a little bit more um, about those two concepts and maybe also in terms of the color scheme, like the, the I mean, we get such bright, uh, such a bright palette and then the sleek, um, you know, silver of monkeys. Um, it's just a really interesting uh, color scheme in thinking about maybe ecstasy and also pain. You know, I'm interested in contradiction. I'm interested in meaning flipping, impulse desire, and those emotional feelings that we go through in a day. Anyone who lives with someone else knows one minute you wanna make love and the next minute you wanna kill the person. Now, both are real. One doesn't cancel the other out. But we go through such a range of emotions within even five or 10 minutes every day. We can be ecstatic and then something happens and two minutes later, we're devastated. How does that happen? How does that all live together? I know for me, I think my job as an artist is to be a mirror and reflect what it's like to be alive during my time. So I know I'm not just a happy camper, you know? I know I get depressed. I know I get anxious. I know I'm ecstatic. I know I laugh. I have a whole range of emotions and experiences that I wanna get into my work. 
I don't know if that answers your question. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. And the writer that I'm most obsessed with is Kafka. Ah, okay. Major, major obsession. Cool. Wow. Um, well, thank you so much um, for this convo. Um, for another ecstatic turn, I want to turn it over to um, our poet of the day, um, Jennifer. Jennifer Rose Bonilla Edgington is an artist and writer who lives by the sea with her husband, Colin, baby boy, Wolfgang, and dog Jasper, Jay Stone. Um, Jennifer, please feel free to turn your mic on and send us off. Um, thank you for having me. Um, um, I have I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just I think maybe the um, we can't quite hear you with the I sometimes ear ear pods don't um, get crackly. I just want to make sure we we hear you. Okay, Is that better. Yeah, much better. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, and um, I'm gonna read four poems. Um, okay. uh, diagnostics. The moments when the wind picks up the traces of things, the weight places upon my face, set behind my eyes, 28 flat black polished skipping stones passing by the molar bone, falling to the sides. Eyelashes touch upon fingertips as bristles of a hairbrush that was once used to smooth down your shiny black coat. Wait in a queue to be sent back to the room filled with settings, schedules, and uncertainty. I mourn what hadn't been lost. Uh, Goldfinch. Temporary life, looking at your eye through the opening of the curtains that cover the slatted blinds. Top of an old red car, the flame is out, but the wick still glows. Gulf Coast winter. My husband has gone fishing, so I lay in bed with my child sleeping on my chest. Like a perfect fit, my cheek rests against his forehead, connecting like two atoms fastened together by electrons, the same way we were connected as embryo and womb. Down the umbilical cord, spiraling life into his existence, cut by our other half to detach physically from me, to attach physically to others. The white noise machine recycles the sounds of calm ocean waves in which I took comfort thinking it was familiar cold Arctic winds. And I'll ask poem, Wolfgang. Stirring my lips the opposite direction of your hair growth upon your head, soothing me. You are the smell of eucalyptus and winter. Humming the nightingale's ode, my fingers dancing on top of yours while you sleep. Linea nigra from the top to bottom fades away as you grow into my arms. Wow, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a perfect way to close us out here. Um, and thank you so, so much, uh, Rona, and Jessica um, and everybody at um, the Mark Strauss Gallery, please make sure you check out the show. You have until April 10th, 16th, 16th. Um, 16th. And we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And please join us Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation featuring Siobhan Little, Linda Matalon, Ksenia Sabolova, and William Corwin. And we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Ty Cooper. Um, and you can please turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you so much, Rona. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Rona. Thank you, thank you Jess. Thank you for reading, Jennifer. Thank I'm you. Your friend, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Rona. Thank you, Jessica. I enjoyed it. I'm your friend, Rona. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> thank you, Rona, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Congrats. Oh, Go see Congrats. the show. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Great poetry. Loved it. <laughs>
We'll stay safe. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.